Hi folks, I'm Brian Stavely, uh, the author of The Emperor's Blades, my first book in epic fantasy, which right now, very exciting, is in development for a TV series with Legion M. Uh, so all summer long, we've been doing these little mini AMAs where folks have been asking questions on Twitter uh, and we've been, I've been answering them and we're gonna compile them so you can check out the answers to all your questions. So we'll just dive right into it. The first one is about the Shin monks who are the people with whom Caden, one of the, the main characters of the first book is studying. Uh, and the person asks, I was wondering who taught the Shin the art of Vaniate? Or maybe they learned it themselves by observing the Kestream, thanks a lot. Um, so the art of Vaniate, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the book, is this art of emptiness, the emptying, some might even say the destruction of the self. And the Shin are an ascetic order who live high in the Bone Mountains, sort of on the edge, even beyond the edge of empire and devote themselves to this practice. And it's a it's a savvy question uh, from this person because the Kestrium are, are an ancient race in my books, immortal and emotionless. They were born uh, before the young gods, the gods of emotion came into the world. So they look like us, they walk like us, they talk like us, but they don't die of natural causes and they don't feel any of the emotions that we feel. They're creatures of pure, reason, rationality, and intellect. Uh, and so this person is sort of saying, hey, wait a minute, the Shin are trying to get rid of their emotions. And you got this ancient, ancient immortal race that uh, lives naturally without emotions. Any connection there? The answer is absolutely. Um, the, the connection comes up in book two, The Providence of Fire. And I don't want to spoil too much but you'll see that there's a dark linkage between the Shin and the Kestrim, not just a, a sort of nice tutelage from one to the next, but a bleaker um, and more nihilistic way that uh, this this emotionless of the emotionlessness of the Kestrim came to be adopted by this sect of humanity. So um, the link is a group called the Ishin. Uh, they were precursors to the Shin, and that, that's all I want to say about it. But yes, absolutely great question, and there is a link. Next question. Are there any Anurian cities or landscapes that you've envisioned but haven't had the ability to use in a book yet? The Kiran Islands and the swamp city of Dombang are such vivid regions with cultures tied to their environments, wondering if there are any you have created that haven't found their way into a book yet. Yes. Absolutely. So if you go on and read, uh, well, if you, this person's already read Skullsworn, um, that shows a little bit of Rasambur, which is the place where the, the priests of the god of death live, uh, these assassins. But um, there are lots of other places. There's a city way up in the north called Freeport that I originally wrote several episodes of, I think, book two took place there and I edited them out. But in the course of imagining this city, it's way, way up kind of above what we would think of as the Arctic Circle. Um, and it's all geothermal. So most of the city is underground uh, and it's powered by these geothermal vents. Uh, endless uh, labyrinths of stone dwellings, uh, stone corridors, some of which are huge, think sort of like Mines of Moria, huge, where the the hall is a great vault overhead and you can almost feel like you're outside. Some of them are winding and cramped and dark and dangerous. Um, so at some point I'd like to return up there and actually include some of that stuff in a book. Another place that's gonna appear in the sequel to The Empire's Ruin, the second book in this new trilogy I'm writing, is the city of Sia, which was the, the capital seat of the Atmani, who were a group of immortal leech lords, so they were sort of wizard rulers um, who ruled this continent a couple, about a thousand years before the events of the Emperor's Blades. And they built an indestructible palace there, it's called the Palace of Eternal Peace, that was then destroyed uh, by one of them. But humans can't, can't do anything about it. The wreckage is there, the slag and the ruin and the slumped over towers and stuff. But the stuff that made it indestructible is still woven through the substance of that palace. So humans have built around and below and beside it, but they, the, the wreckage of this massive palace is still there. Um, and it plays a major role in uh, this next book that I'm writing. So yeah, I've, I've thought a lot about different parts of this world that haven't yet appeared in the books. Here's a good question. If you were an average character born in Anur and had to choose a path for yourself, what would you do? 
Would you become a Ketrol or Skull Sworn or take up a regular job like a bartender or a blacksmith in a faraway city? What would your ideal Anurian experience look like? I would not become one of the Skull Sworn, although I've imagined my way fully into the world and environment of the priests of death. I do not worship the god of death, nor would I want to go around killing people. I don't think I would become Ketrol. Uh, I, I have no military background myself, and though I do a lot of um, sort of outdoor endurance events, trail runs and stuff like that. Um, I don't know that I have what it takes to be a special forces soldier uh, to be involved in the kind of stuff that the Ketrol are involved in. So I would say no to both of those things. I think, uh, and this is not a path at all that I've taken in our world, I think I might be tempted to be a merchant. Uh, one of the things that's most appealing about the world of Anur to me is how cosmopolitan it is. The empire spans two different continents and borders um, another empire and another uh, series of independent kingdoms and polities. And um, there's people from all over the world mixing and mingling, both in the capital city itself, but in all the other major cities of Anur. And I think it would be fun to experience kind of the scope of that world, to, to travel to different places, to source, you know, whether it's fruit or fabric or grain or Grain doesn't sound very interesting, I guess. Um, but but to you to travel around the world and bring the things from one section of, you know, from one culture, you know, over to uh, this other culture, you know, bring them into this melting pot. I sort of think about the Silk Road kind of uh, in its heyday as this this mixing ground of peoples and languages and cultures, um, different religions and styles of dress and different types of food. And uh, that, that's appealing to me about Anur. So something that would allow me to, to sink myself into that, it would be, I think, pretty neat. Final question of the day. Uh, this one's from Glenn. I'll be doing the Appalachian Trail soon. Which reminds you more of the mountains in the Unhewn Throne, Vermont, New Hampshire, or Maine? So there are a number of different ranges in mountain ranges in my books. The, the Bone Mountains, are the mountains where the Shin monks are located. They're up in the Northeast. And those are this sort of clean white granite. When I was imagining them, I was really imagining the Sierra Nevadas out in California. So uh, some spots outside of Bishop uh, or Mammoth. Uh, these, that's the same range that you know Yosemite is a part of. Um, and so I was picturing something like that. And the closest thing to that in New England is definitely the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Uh, there's a lot of exposed granite big slides, big ledges, you know, views off into the distance. The White Mountains aren't quite as large as the Bone Mountains or quite as forbidding, but that there are definitely spots up there where you can get the feel. Um, but then there's other mountain ranges. The Romsdals are kind of in the Northwest. I picture more like the Rockies, uh, which I have a, a great fondness for the Rockies, but they're, they're kind of, a lot of them are just these big piles of rubble. Um, that are, you know, especially in the summer, it just looks like a huge scree field. Um, and then the Ancaz Mountains are the border in between um, Eridroa, the, the Anurian Empire and the Manjari Empire. And there I picture something much more Southwestern, this red and golden sandstone um, uh, and these buttes and plateaus. Uh, so, so there's a lot of different, I, I spend a lot of time in the mountains because I do a lot of rock climbing, hiking, trail running, mountain biking. And so I, I drew heavily on my own personal experience with different mountain ranges, whether it's the Alps or you know the Rockies or whatever, in, in creating this world. So this was a fun question to get. And also, good luck with the AT. Uh, that's, that's quite a challenge and um, wishing you the best, Glenn. So thank you to everyone uh, who showed up today and during all these installments of the AMAs. These are great questions. It's fun to look back on my first trilogy, my first book, which was The Empire's, the, the Emperor's Blades. Uh, my newest book just came out, The Empire's Ruin. It's the beginning of a new trilogy that takes place in the same world as The Emperor's Blades. Some of the characters you will recognize, some of them are brand new. So I hope you'll check it out and uh, thanks for the questions. I think we've got one more installment of these. So if you haven't got your questions in yet, it's not too late. Take care, everyone. Thank you.